Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Molly Rowan Leach, and it is truly a privilege and an honor to be the host for this evening, um, the guide. But I also am really excited to have you interact tonight with our, our wonderful guest, who I'll introduce in, in just a quick moment. Uh, just a little bit about restorative justice on the rise. It has been in motion since 2011, and we've had an extraordinary palette of voices from international perspectives in the field of restorative justice, as well as in peace building and related areas, providing opportunities for people to connect all over the world. Um, we were really, I, I kid you not, the first podcast focused on restorative justice as a public um, live dialogue platform back when Zoom wasn't even a thing. <laughs> so um, I know a lot of people have joined in and creating public spaces for dialogues and storytelling um, around restorative practices and beyond. And I think it's fabulous because media and connection, this is the upside of tech, is what we're doing here with our wonderful guest and our community today. And what we continue to um, achieve, I hope, is a growing international connection, um, really rooted in the power of storytelling and discovering universal wisdom that is embedded within this uh, extraordinary field of, of practice. And a lot of times our podcast conversations will really dive into the edge areas of the field, as well as um, a wellspring of insights from grassroots practitioners like tonight's guest. Um, you can find out more about Restorative Justice on the Rise by going to our website, which is restorativejusticeontherise.org. We are streaming and updating our podcast like this one will drop in a day or two um, on Apple iTunes podcast, as well as Spotify. And tonight's dialogue, again, is interactive, and that means voice in as you wish. Um, that means use the chat or come on camera if you wish, or simply on your microphone. Um, I think one of the most powerful things that I can share with you that I would invite you to come back and continue to be a part of this dialogue community and platform is that a lot of times in, the, in, in transforming ourselves and in transforming systems, it's isolated work. And um, the stories that come from these spaces are particularly powerful um, that link us back to ourselves, to our inner wisdom as facilitators, perhaps, as program directors, as people who are really yearning for connection, reconnection, and for um, offering that with others, no matter what pocket of service that you're in. So again, thank you for the privilege of being your host tonight. And let's dive in with Jabali Stewart. And um, I would like to just share kind of an, uh, an ad hoc um, from the heart about Jabali. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll share his official bio with you as well. Um, Jabali and I met through Kay Pranis who is one of um, uh, my deepest mentors in the field of restorative practice. Um, I know Jabali uh, has worked with her deeply as well and refers to her as um, one of the people who trained him in the lineage of circle keeping. And um, Kay referred Jabali to me because restorative justice on the rise often gets referrals for, uh, or requests for, um, for services. And one of the most important things that actually Tim Chapman referred to last week in our extraordinary dialogue with him was thinking about you know, the person who is offering the services or facilitation, um, who might the community really appreciate having in that space with them. And that's always a leading question that I ask. And I asked Kay and Kay sent me to meet Jabali. And that's how we first met Jabali. Um, and I, I can't 
thank you enough for being who you are in this field. Um, there's more than we can say as far as who you are in a very short few minutes, but I've been deeply influenced by your presence, yes, uh, by the power of your synthesis of, of modalities, of creativity, of myth, mm -hmm. of cultural perspectives. And I'm excited to hear uh, what you'd like to share alongside and with us tonight. Um, and I also want to mention that you're an inclusion specialist and that you utilize peacemaking circle in schools. And that's um, throughout the entire range of traditional education, kindergarten through college. You're also supporting peacemaking circles in businesses, families, government, and community settings. And as I mentioned a moment ago, Jabali has trained in the lineage of circle keeping connected to Mark Wedge, Kate Pranis, and Barry Stewart. And he's been doing that, being that for nearly a decade, of course, for his whole life, we know that. Um, but besides keeping circle, he also trained in and practices other art of hosting social technologies, all with a focus on institutional cultural change. He's a, a public speaker who has cultivated a practice of deep one-on-one -on -one cultural counsel. And his work is deeply informed by his belief and practice of sensible love-based leadership. So without further ado, as it were, Javali, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us. It's good to be here. It's really good to see you again, Molly. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what unfolds tonight. I see some familiar faces in this crowd. It's, <laughs> good to see. it's really good to see. And um, yeah, let's get into it. There's So let's, like, yeah, let's dive right in. And if you're just joining us, welcome. Welcome, global community. We had people from all over the world RSVP for this evening. If you're joining us um, on the recording, welcome as well. Thank you for being with us. Um, so Jabali, would you please um, be willing, if you would, to share your reason for being in the field? What brought you into restorative practices? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like how far back do I go? Um, the I think the impetus for this kind of work has been with me most of my life. Um, I grew up as an academic nomad on the road all the time. And so figuring out how to be with people and how to feel included wherever I was was always a thing. And then when I went to... I started out my undergrad career as a uh, started out in vet, veterinary medicine and then shifted to engineering. I was going to be a mechanical engineer. Uh, and then I dropped out and I went back, I studied math and I dropped out again. And, and all the times that I dropped out was because I was being a punk rock musician and going on tour and, and did a whole lot of that. Uh, and while I was out on tour, um, I started thinking, if I go to school, all right, when I go back to school, I'll study something that appeals, something that gets me moving. Like, I want to do it outside school, inside school. And actually, peace studies was what I was going to look into. There was no peace studies program, per se. Um, I, I went to the Ohio State University, but there was a religious studies program. It was the closest I got. And so inside that world, I touched base with um, circle, circle practices. Um, and then fast forward, and it's actually one of my, I, I gave a paper at the American Academy of Religion, ironically enough, where I talked about how indigenous social technology could be a savior to um, this country. So that was 1997. Then fast forward, um, I got a PhD in ethnomusicology. I was studying the intersection of music, dance, and ritualized violence because the conflict thing is still crucial in my brain. Um, and then um, I didn't go into the academy. I didn't. I thought about being a professor, but 2008 happened, and there was no jobs. I found myself in the independent school world and doing 
diversity work. <laughs> and doing diversity work is challenging. Um, I'm not a trained diversity specialist. So I didn't have, like I didn't set out to do diversity work. Um, but because of my background and because of, you know, sort of the social sciences bend, it felt like a good way to go. And um, I got myself into uh, a school here. I've worked at a couple of schools, but the last school that I attended or worked in um, officially as an employee of the school, the former chair of the board of that school uh, was the executive director of the Center for Ethical Leadership. And the then head of the school um, in my first year recommended that I go meet and talk with him. Uh, the man's name was Dale Ninao. So I went to go talk to Dale Ninao. This was 2011. And we talked for a while, made a pretty good relationship, um, picked up a lot of things from him. And um, that resulted in him inviting me to a six day circle uh, sponsored by the Center for Ethical Leadership here in Seattle. And it was um, it was a lot of coming back home in a way. And it was very clear that this was my future, especially given the work that I was called to do uh, in my school at the school at the time. Um, I mean, for any of you who've ever tried to have conversations about race, just in the regular way, you know, whatever you want to describe that as, um, you know, it's a problematic thing. And so for that six day circle, I watched people grapple with one question for the whole time was what's your relationship to race? And there was so much that unfolded in there. Wow that became really clear, this is a good way forward and I need to devote myself to doing this in some kind of way. So I set about trying to work it out in the schools and then hunting for it everywhere and anywhere, trying to make a, a path forward for this kind of work. Um, and I ended up actually getting pulled into a bunch of different schools. Public schools, we're just starting to talk about it in certain public schools. Um, it actually was easier to manifest the work in those institutions than even in the institution that I worked for. Um, but then I also managed or was fortunate enough, really, there's a former director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs um, here in Seattle uh, named Ku Vu, who took a chance on me um, and invited me into a project called the Immigrant Family Institute, which I, with my dear colleague, Lee, uh, Dr. Amelia Dare, um, we designed and launched. Um, and it was really circle engagement, circle with police officers, immigrant families, and the children of immigrant families, um, 10 to 18 working mostly with families who had had some sort of touch with the, the legal system. That opened up volumes. The, the doorways that opened up from that were enormous. And I started finding myself here, there, and everywhere, just called to sit in circle, to hold circle and keep circle. Um, well, we get calls from families. Would you come and sit with our family? as we work through some stuff, some of those, those pretty beautiful. And also getting calls to help um, sexual offenders. Um, that's powerful work in and of itself. Actually, you know, it's the sort of thing that can be done anywhere with any, it's with humans, period. Um, I got a chance to, there was a person on the screen here who uh, invited me in to keep a circle between the city and a, a, a garden, a pop-up garden. So it was fascinating work. It never ceases to inspire slash surprise me. 
where people will go when given the chance to just show up and be themselves as much as they possibly can. And that's something that's always been kind of big in me. Yeah. Can you, I'm an old school punk rocker. I still am. This like, you're not going to get that out of me. That's who I am. And I take it seriously. I actually just went and saw Otobaki Bieber the other night. It's Japanese punk rock band. It's amazing. But part of that whole world is being yourself, not the stereotypical punk that people think punk is. You know, like it looks a certain kind of way. It sounds like, like there's, there's some, there's always something deeper and there is something deeper to that world. And being yourself, actually literally being yourself is crucial to that. Can you do that? And can you do that in the presence of other people who are doing the same thing? Um, is just that's kind of a core core tenet of who I am. So I guess that would be my long answer to that. <laughs> Sorry, question. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And it occurs to me that I'd really love to, if I may honor your um, collective organization. Mm. For, and I always have a trouble yeah. with the linguistic articulation. So awesome. could you help me, please? Why ru Why ru ro? Or why ru ro? Why ru ro? And this is an organization with uh, just a, a really beautiful website. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, please, please visit it. They do a lovely introduction of themselves, um, the mm -hmm. Circle of Keepers, in a manner that is is such um, that they're passing the talking piece to each other to introduce themselves um, yes. on their website. It's beautiful. I've never seen that done before. And then you also have a lovely video, well, just more than one, but there's a video there also for those who are interested in getting a feel for um, a connection circle of sorts, right, Jabali? There's Correct. There's some wonderful resources there to take, take in. There's a few things up there. And just to be honest, we're actually retooling the website as we speak. Yeah. Well, it <laughs> um, still looks beautiful and it's very inviting. And and one of the, the, the things that feels generative for me um, as a, a fellow practitioner is that it, it exhibits a level of um, adherence, even online, to the the depth of the practice so thank you for that it's really that's who we are yeah it's when true. we came to sorry yeah uh, when we came together we um i love my team so much it's not my team i love our team so much because we did not just jump into doing business right this is yeah. more than just being in business we set about sitting in circle with each other for a year before ever moving into the world to offer anything. Um, without, like jokingly saying like, we're, we're not drug dealers, you know, we can partake in what we practice and we should partake in what we practice. And that was actually something that drove me crazy in my sort of professional facilitating life is seeing people present things that they themselves don't do. It just it doesn't make sense to me. This is, and so and we're is... gonna we're gonna get into that a little bit tonight, I believe. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that nuance between theory and practice, and um, excuse me for interrupting, Jabali, but I want to I want to give a little teaser to everyone tonight that Jabali and I were uh, discussing what he what might be currently present for him. And um, he, he shared that he's been thinking a lot about how schools have done the work, um, a disservice by adopting circle as an alternative. And um, we're gonna talk about the tiered approach as well, that how it dilutes the real work. And that a lot of times it's about the work is for the kids and not for the adults. So just a little teaser there and go back to where you were please though, Jabali. Um, and tell us a little bit more about about your team and what okay. you'd like us to know. I, I know that you're based in Seattle. 
but I like to, I, I'm sure people are curious, like, are, are you global as well with your circles online and tell us more. Do. We have, we are global uh, in that it, we, <laughs> so the team is, it's uh, myself and um, Dr. Keiko Ozeki, who actually was with me in that first six day circle of which I spoke. And then she later went on to uh, work for the Center for Ethical Leadership and kind of spearheaded their uh, peacemaking circle initiative for a while. Um, and then uh, there's Emily Warren, who is a former math teacher. Uh, she worked with me back at the last school. Um, taught in circle, right? So every time we go someplace and people are like, oh, we can't do this because we have this stuff to teach. You know, here's Emily who taught math, high level math in circle and outperformed her colleagues because of course. Uh, and then we have Wesley St. Clair, former judge here in Seattle, who was really instrumental in getting a circle into the court system inside Seattle. He is currently working at the national level uh, with the um, cadre of judges who are trying to figure out how to do this. And Wesley, you know, Wesley was an individual who said something. I met Wesley probably 2013, 2014. He was still sitting uh, on the bench at the time. And um, we were sitting around talking about the work. Wesley was not an early adopter, you know. Wesley was definitely somebody who wanted to test things and I sat in a lot of circles in community with Wesley where he was really kind of, you know, being skeptical, which I think is healthy. I actually approached it that way myself. Like, it feels good, but I, is this really what it is? Go into it with healthy skepticism and then do the work, right? And um, and he did. And now, as he says, he makes a Kool-Aid because he sees it for what it is and he understands and he recognizes it. But the thing that he said that really landed just so well in my being um, was that the courts in his courtroom was the trash heap of society. It's the end. It's the place where people go when they have been failed by various systems um, throughout our reality. And so he would make the point, circle in the courts is, that's great. It is better and more humane, but where is it in these other echelons of our society so that we don't end up with the concentration of people that we do have inside our court system? Uh, we all need to be humanized. We all need to develop relationships. We all need to know how to work across lines of difference. We all need to know how to be human in this environment. That's. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. So where's the practice? Where's the training? Where's the where's the skilling up? Where is that? And that really put, uh, just to the audience, is this a PG-13 show or is this <laughs> an adult show? Because I, I will let the swear words fly because that's my na native tongue. Um, but that was really a major point for me, so. I've been walking in with that in mind and heart for a while now. Polly um, says those... bring it on, and I agree. What's that? Polly, thank you. I agree with Polly. She says bring it on. Shit. Let's go for yeah, it. Polly tonight. knows. Polly knows. <laughs> no, no holds barred here, okay? Uh, the worst they can do is ban us from Apple Podcasting. And then we'll go <laughs> underground with, with this uh, drop. Yeah. Good. All right. It's on. <laughs> So um, we also, we had two other people who were co-founders with us, um, Monica Rojas Stewart and Dave Werner, who both, they actually peeled off to go to, take, like Monica is going to be a professor of dance. And Dave, I think, went on to go do his own individual counseling. That was where he, his heart really is. And so mm -hmm. the four of us, me, Keiko, Wesley, and Emily, we are... We're holding it down and continue to do the work. Um, yeah, that's that's who we are. 
Thank you, Chip Lally. And as you were sharing about the Seattle region, I would like to just put in an honoring of someone who recently passed from that area out to the world um, of Andrea Brennecke and her beauty within the movement of restorative justice um, in Seattle and in response to the uh, murder of the shel the shelterless woodworker. Um, can't remember his name off the top of my head right now. Um, Williams, wasn't it? Yeah, but just, uh, you know, it's important that we remember those who have come before us and our teachers and um, Andrea de devoted her life to restorative justice practices. And she was a uh, Harvard educated attorney, uh, but she was one of the most compassionate listeners I've ever known. So just a shout out to her and her family and uh, much love out to um, the universe for her life because she really did spark what seems to be quite something, not just in the Seattle area with what she helped to convene with that circle um, with the community, right? Um, between police and community after the shooting and the death of, of this gentleman, the artist. Um, is that correct? I mean, in your memory that that, that was a, a major shift for, for Seattle? I think that was, uh, was one that that was that was one of the first times it was so public in nature that this was what was going yeah. to happen that things were going to unfold this way. It got yeah. more attention um, and put things on the radar in a really good way. Mm -hmm. So, Andrea, she yeah. did. She. Yeah, I just for, for everyone listening and with us tonight, there. If you aren't familiar with that story. Um, I believe Tikkun Magazine has a very good article on Andrea and on the w John Williams case. Now I'm remembering the name. Um, yeah. And that that, you know, was quite a moment in time that was significant. Absolutely. Um, so, um, so thank you for setting the tone of um, just the foundation of, of your story. Is there anything else that you would like to make known? before we kind of dive into some of these sticky areas of the movement itself um, around work in schools, we, we could start there. And certainly we're gonna wanna open it up for some some discussion with, with people tonight too, here soon. That's good. Um, the, I guess the only thing that I would offer is that my viewpoints are mine and um, I speak from, from and for myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I consider myself an expert. I'm a practitioner and continue to practice and hone my skills, my art, um, and my practice. So it's an ever-learning, ever-growing reality. So I just need to say that. Thank you. Thank you. And I, too, as your host, um, certainly always strive to create a beautiful container for inspiring conversation and connection. But always welcoming feedback. So if you have feedback for either Jabali or myself, uh, make sure to reach out. There's an email in the invitation and RSVP form, but it's also, I'll just say it out loud, rjonrise at gmail.com so that you can continue the conversation if something arises for you after tonight that you want to reach out to Jabali about too. I can help to make that happen. So Jabali, um, just uh, let's let's circle back around really quickly to what you mentioned about the math teacher who does circle for her math class. Did you want to yeah. say anything more about that? Because I know that there's a lot of people that uh, wanted to come tonight live that weren't able to for other, re you know, for scheduling reasons um, that are very curious about your work within schools. So just in a nutshell, how did she create that? How did she create that space to teach math in a circle? Uh, so that's really her story to tell. I should let and I should yeah, let her. Yeah, Emily's story. Okay. Yeah, it's Emily's story. But this um, is happening. <laughs> so. Oh, it yeah. happens. We we yeah. so there was. I can give you a sort of a parallel because I co-taught a class with Emily and um, another teacher who taught history, and so 
the class was all actually statistics. The class was statistics and social justice in Seattle was the name of the class. And so we, I kind of led the processing portion and we used circle for it entirely. The history teacher would teach history of Seattle. Emily taught statistics. We would go out and we would study cases. We would go out and we would look at communities. We rode the, the light rail to take um, survey data. Like there was just all kinds of work went into this class, but we would always come back and sit in a circle to process not only what we were learning, because we were all learning it together, but we were also processing how and how we were grappling with the information in the class. Like we are not all the same people. And there were some students of conservative bend who struggled. And there were students in the class who were not conservative. They're super liberal. They struggled. And watching them struggle with how to interpret the data, how to interpret narrative, how to interpret that all unfolded inside circle. It was probably one of my favorite classes ever. Um, but those clearly they learned history, they learned statistics, and they actually learned how to talk and listen amongst each other to arrive at better conclusions for their own work. Because at the end of the day, they had to create their own um, project slash report, you know? Um, and to a T, every single one of them produced some incredible stuff that they all said would never, it wouldn't have been this rich if we hadn't done it the way we did it. So it's, it's, I'm not sure why it's, um, well, I do know why. I think the pedagogy of teaching, the, the act of teaching for so long has been, I need to tell you what to do. I need to, I need to just stand up here and dictate everything. Um, and then that's not, it's not to say that that's totally wrong. There are times when you do need to stand up and give a lecture. You know, I've given plenty of lectures myself, but in order for material to be uh, ingested, you know, I always say teaching is about relationships. If you don't have a good relationship with kids, you don't have a good relationship with the students, you don't have a good relationship forming inside the classroom, there, there's more work for you to do to get the information through, to get the information across. So it just makes sense that the relationship building component of teaching be taken seriously. And I don't say that, I know I already hear all the teachers that I know are, oh, I take it seriously. I know you take it seriously, but there's another way to do it. Um, and in so doing it that way, there's also possible to process material of the class, gain understanding. How do people, kids went home, they did homework last night, if you're still doing it that way. Okay, so then when you come in, check in, how things going, do a quick round, and then do it round on, well, what what problems gave you grief last night? And then do a round on who solved the problem, this, who solved the problem in a way that would be handy for people to understand, right? Like there's, and in doing that, you're still building relationship, you're building connection, you're building understanding of, oh man, this person understands things this way, this person understands as the as the teacher in the room, I'm starting to recognize exactly how people are receiving information. And that helps me then change how I deliver information. I remember when I was teaching a class at the university, it was, it, it was the common thing. How do you teach? You say the same thing 25 times, 25 different ways, right? You do the math. It's you. It's repetition, but not in repetition of the exact same thing. It's you have to, you have to be flexible to be a good teacher. Um, and so that's where circle comes in really handy. Uh, and can we just keep going? I'll, Cause I don't want, I really we work in a lot of schools right now. And the thing that I don't want to come across is that teachers are failing at this, that teachers are failing in not implementing circle. I do not want that message to be out there. I really don't. It's the way in which things of this nature get institutionalized that is a failing point, right? This isn't, we, I, I oftentimes remind people like when we sit in circle, it's indigenous practice. It's, let's just say the word. 
it's indigenous practice and it has its own rhythm it has its own reasoning and mechanics and its own everything it's it's not of it's it's not of the colonizing western world let's just say that right it is in i want to remind people that the colonizing western world colonized itself as well which means its own indigenous wisdom which oftentimes got coded druids witches and all the rest they were assassinated killed and made out to be um evil uh, and so with that was lost a lot of indigenous practice including things like sitting in circle right so we all have it to institutionalize a practice like circle means you it um it requires us to actually be with the work as it is instead of trying to fit it into this box it's like I remember we sat, we did some circle work with Google and this guy kept saying, well, I just don't understand how we're going to square this circle. And I was like, why do you want to square the circle? The circle is round. Sit with the roundness that is a circle. Stop trying to make it a square. But that, that statement right there is how I see circle being implemented inside a lot of schools. Uh, this idea of tiers, the tier one, tier two, tier three, just breaking it down that way has a way of, and again, this is just me, right? But in my experience, what that does is it breaks down what circle is. It, it, and it has people trying to think, okay, am I on this level? Am I in this tier? Am I on this tier? Am I in this tier? As opposed to we sit in circle to learn how to be with each other. We sit in circle in order to better understand each other. We sit in circle in order to better understand ourselves. And the circle can hold everything. So as we're sitting in circle for our daily check-in, as we're sitting in circle to understand what the homework was, as we're sitting in circle to process our guidelines for the beginning of the year and you know revisit them, as we're sitting in all these different circles, we're doing the work of sitting in circle for conflict resolution. It's not a tier one, tier two, tier three thing. It is a, we sit in circle in order to manage uh, culture, in order to keep an eye on culture, in order to learn and shift and change the culture, in order to make sense of everything that happens when groups of people get together. That includes conflict. Conflict is a natural part of human gathering. So, when I say that the tears have made people think of a certain way, like what the circle is, I'm also bringing in this other elephant in the room that is that circle for so many schools was just a replacement for discipline, which is, again, in my opinion, the wrong way to go about it. It sends the wrong message. It does. So does it mean to have tears? Great question. So I, yeah, great question <laughs> before I keep going. To, for it to have tears in, um, in schools, they're oftentimes the rolled circle out in, in tier one, tier two, tier three. And I'll give it to you the best I can. Tier one was considered the community building level of circle. Tier three is considered super harm has been done, um, possible suspension, possible expulsion, um, acts of physical violence, right? That's tier tier three. Uh, tier two is something in between those, those things, those two tiers is the best I can. And I'm glad you asked that question because oftentimes I go into school so I'm like, can you tell me what tier one is? Can you tell me what tier two is? Can you tell me what tier three is? And a lot of people can't answer the question. How do you shift what who you are between these different tiers? A lot of people can't answer the question. A lot of people had no tier three. If there's a problem, we gotta, we gotta address the problem. It's a reactionary model, a model that is geared towards what well, we can't really suspend the kids anymore. So we got to punish them somehow, apply discipline somehow. So put them in a circle. 
And the message that that sends to the kids and the, mess and the message that it sends to the adults in the space is kind of one of the same. Like circle is only about crisis. It's only about trauma. It's only about when there's a problem in the space. It's about discipline. It's it in a way gets coded negatively, right? The the wholeness of the human experience has been that can be held in circle is diminished to only the space of conflict. And what I see is that a lot of people who are steeped in circle are in that way, conflict is their only focal point. And they are, it's hard for them to even understand relationship building. It's hard for them to, I mean, but I mean, really relationship building. You know, to sit in circle for the purposes of cultivating relationships. Uh, they're, they've been so hardwired with, you sit in circle for problems, um, that it's hard for them to, to go to that other space, which is where we need a lot more work. You know, I, for those of you who are not familiar with the lineage that from which I come, there's the usage of the medicine wheel. The medicine wheel, if you imagine a clock from 12 to 12, and if you've heard this before, you you know this quite well, right? But those those are four quadrants, 12 to three, three to six, six to nine, and nine to 12. And so then when the introduction, this quadrant one, building relationships, quadrant two, identifying issues, quadrant three, identifying solutions, quadrant four. It's a really simple and beautiful uh, frame. Uh, theory of change, right? And the reality that we most of the time see is high introduction, quadrant one, boom, jump to quadrant three. And that even includes in how circle is implemented in school. We need a replacement for discipline, boom, quadrant three. All of the work that is quadrant two work, which we lean on deeply, like we, that's, um, that's the heart of it. Um, bypassing that into quadrant three, we are actually arriving into that quadrant with way more baggage, way more misunderstanding, way more um, uh, assumptions, you know, which are deadly, which then makes the practice um, not as not as healthy as it could be, right? Uh, and again, I don't want to chastise anybody for doing the work that they do. It's, this is the system in which we've been injected into. And maybe I should stop there because I you see that. <laughs> yeah. it, I mean, I, I, I hope that lands because I honestly... It's been really painful to see people who I know have been held up as circle keepers for a while, who those keepers have a hard time even fathoming the idea of sitting in circle with their colleagues because they've been so wedded and geared to sitting in circle in conflict. Yeah. Uh, the doing this other thing for them just doesn't, it doesn't register. It doesn't, for them, it doesn't feel like you're really sitting in circle, you know? And for us, why, again, why tier one, two, and three kind of is false is that we could be having, and I've sat in these circles, I actually kept a circle for a school in California where we, if we were using those tiers, what we were doing was probably somewhere between tier one and tier two. If if I have to use tears in terms of the, the feeling and the, the case. And then as we're sitting in circle, it got ugly. It was, it, it was massive hardcore conflict where somebody would call this tier three because those are the emotions that surfaced. Right. And so if I, if I, in my brain, I'm like, it's, is only a tier one conversation. And now suddenly I'm not practiced enough and just sitting in circle. 
I don't know how to handle the conflict when it emerges. And it's going to emerge. You know, like, I don't want people to walk into circle feeling like because they have this false sense of a tear that that's all it's going to be, whether it is difficult or whether it is easy. It's, we, we sit in circle, we sit in circle. Um, Thank you so sure. much, Jabali. Um, I want to linear time. I wish I could stretch it right now and just let you continue in that flow. Um, I want to acknowledge and honor what's happening in the chat. And also um, that we had some questions come in previous to tonight's session. So um, just to, to go back to Charito and thank him for um, that question about the tears and and uh, thank you, excuse me, she, Charito, I'm, I apologize. Um, did you want to say anything further about that, Charito? Did you want to ask Jabali anything further? Just wanting to give you a chance to voice if you do. Well, thank you for the explanation because I am not that familiar and it was like I don't I don't get it where your beautiful wisdom comes in criticizing those things and it has all the sense it has all the sense I think um uh, always you know the system fight and <laughs> circles are restored to just and then they they adopted and they co-opted <laughs> and we have to be always bring in the wisdom that you have bring in order to really say, no, this is what it is and this is what it is. And um, and it's a beautiful thing that they try to adapt, but it's always like, no, this, you can't put it in the box like you were saying. So thank you. I appreciate what you say. Absolutely. Definitely. And, and yes, I hear you and I, it resonates so greatly. Appreciate your words. Thank you so much, Charito. It's good to have you back with us today. I hope all is well. Um, and Leif, thank you for your comment. And if uh, just always like to give people a chance to voice in, would you like to voice in your comment or shall I read it on your behalf? Or would you like to camera on and have a little um, interactive with Jabali with it? I, I don't really have to, um, you, you can voice it. I, I mean, I just put it in there as a response. That's all. Yeah. So what Leaf says um, is really quite beautifully articulated and reflects back. Um, restorative teaching is rooted in relationship. I taught in college in circle for several years and Jabali joined a session class by Zoom. He asked a provocative question of my co-learners. He asked, who would you not want to be in circle with? And I love what Jabali says about the tears which create a hierarchy and a pigeonholing that is antithetical to circle. Thanks for naming this. Sure. Thank you, Leif. Absolutely. Thank you, Leif. And Leif so is going to be on with us in the future talking about, no, looking forward to that, Leif. I am too. Leif knows what's up. Leif is, Leif is with it, and deep with it. And teaching in circle, there's another example for you, right? So I'm going to, I'll be here for that one. And so um, just wanting to um, invite anyone else to voice in and um, of course choose to camera on or in the chat. Um, just really want to support your needs as far as comfort um, in how you might ask your question. I would love to, in the meantime, um, honor a question that came in previous to the session. And um, it's from Sheila in, in Colorado, which is actually where I'm sitting right now. Sheila says, I see some school administrators new to the idea of restorative chats, circles, convenings, and new to Ubuntu in practice, appearing to jump into the default mode of only seeing RJ skill sets as an end in themselves rather than the vehicle and emotional spiritual platform for a deep shift in the culture of an entire school, organization, or team from domination system to partnership society. 
So um, there's that. And then she goes on. Um, she says, I see it as vital to educate the parent family business community to also embrace these shifts in handling conflict and competitiveness drama triangle in all aspects of life. Restorative justice cannot be siloed as we human beings are so inclined to do. Would love your thoughts on making restorative justice skill sets universally understood throughout our communities. So thank you, Sheila. Ooh, great question. In a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> great question. So Sheila, I see, I see what you see. Um, as you can probably tell. And and again, like I don't want to point a finger at anybody. I really don't. Um, I'm not pointing a finger at teachers. I'm not pointing a finger at principals. To be real, I uh, kept uh, with group of folk out here, we kept some principal circles, circles just for principals. It was honestly really depressing. Um, there is a sense in which they themselves are not getting that work, the restorative work. And then they're in a position to um, require, ask heavily of their faculty and staff to do this work, but they themselves are not with the work. So how do you champion something? How do you live into something that you yourself are not being invited into? And the reason why the principals feel that way is because their executive directors or whoever's over them is not doing the work with them. And then the school board is not doing the work. Like there's a reason why it's not, there's a reason why it is the way it is. Um, it's being seen as a program, an add-on, a quick fix, uh, a pill. Uh, this is flavor of the month. This it, The way you described it is, uh, well, I'm not going to butcher your words, but like deep culture shift, deep culture change, you know, the stewarding, the, the pastoral care of community, which is something that is overlooked often, right? It's not embedded vertically from the adults on the school board all the way down. And we do miss out with all of the parents horizontally in the school um, because there's this this oftentimes I've heard fear of what comes when, because it's again, the mindset of circle connected to conflict, bringing parents in and having conflict is hard for administration to, to grapple with. So then I will try to say, okay, so then be proactive about it. Like have circles that are open circles for the community, for people to, we did we did stuff like that at one of my old school, and it, it's massively, um, it's just an experiential shift and change in how people show up in the school, the families, right? Uh, and I'm preaching to the choir, because I'm sure you know this. Uh, but then how to somehow, relieve things that are coded as requirements from the plates of educators so that there is some bandwidth available. There is some room, some spaciousness for them to lean into this kind of work. It actually calls for a complete reimagining of what it means to be educated and to be an educator which goes to the halls of academia. How, how is academia working to help teachers understand how restorative practices work? How does academia operate in a restorative manner so that teachers aren't just getting it in theory, they're actually brought into it in an embodied kind of way? How is that happening so that school boards, it, I feel like you shouldn't even be able to, to um, sit on the school board unless you have direct hands-on lived experience with elements that are 
I've got a lot to say about this one. Like, if you don't know what this restorative stuff is, and then you are just assuming that because you're a, a, a human and you live in this country that you have what it takes to lead the school board, um, no. <laughs> Actually, you should know what it is that is happening. How do you evaluate something that you are not doing? How it, it's that's nobody would do that in their own other body of work, right? You always have to know what it is that you are stewarding. That's just kind of basic. I think that's basic, actually. I don't know if that it is necessarily basic. Um, and that's where we see things right now. We see principals who are not clear on how to even evaluate the restorative practices stuff happening in their school because they themselves are not practitioners. They themselves are not involved in what the work actually is. Uh, there's a fear that's at play. And, you know, I actually had a conversation with a principal recently and, you know, they say the things and you don't, you know it, but you don't want to hear it is that the, well, we're not trained to do this. We're not trained to be that way. We're trained to tell people what to do and have them do it. And so for us to do anything outside of that, to be in this in this other way, um, it's scary. And they're, 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 their professional mind tells them it's not the right way to do things, right? I think actually, Something that I often use is um, the Ernest Shackleton voyage. The I think it's in the 1920s. Uh, I believe it was English explorer who took the boat and whole, did the whole thing. Oh, beyond the hours of Ernest. Thank you, Molly. Sorry, I do like to talk. Um, but he took this exploration out and then they shipwrecked in Antarctica, cold, my God, how are we gonna live? And what, if you read the story, you really get a sense of an individual who before it was even called restorative anything. Like he just recognized that he needed to step back and listen and be with his people to gain the wisdom that was in the crew in order to, for them to figure out how they were going to survive. He also needed to step up every now and again and say, okay, we're going to go this way. You know, there's a way for those two things to exist at the same time and to be utilized at different times for the well being of the community on the whole. In his case, the entire crew survived what could have been a completely devastating set of circumstances. So, you know, I asked this principal who just told me, well, we're not trained to do that. I was like, well, how's that going for you? How's it going using what you've been trained to do all now? And it's not good. It's not worse. So then when, when do you stop beating your head against a wall and allow yourself to be a little, um, go out on a limb, you know? And I also think until we amongst ourselves um, help people re-understand or re-educate people of what restorative practices are among the parent bodies. Like wherever you are, if you're next to some parents, talk to them about it. Talk to them about it so that they can actually start trying to figure out who needs to be on the school board because that's a position, that's a seat, you know. And if I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who actually is deep with the work, I'm I'm going to vote for that person because they have a, half a sense of how to actually steward this and systematically, you know, in a good way. Um, Bali, I, I just want to say how much I appreciate this frame in, from the context also of the valuation of hands-on experience, you hmm. know, experiential education, exactly. uh, circle education but also the valuation of practitioners who may not have a PhD per se, but who have sat with many in many contexts, like yourself. I, I, I think you also have a PhD, but yeah. aside from that, there are many yeah. people in this field who are doing incredible work as keepers who don't right. have accreditation, but who have the wisdom 
exactly. the knowledge and experience that um, I hope has voice and value and and can connect with communities in a way that's meaningful. So that's one exactly. area of this field that I'm excited um, to hopefully see some change in how we value the relationship of of the wisdom and and who can plug in. Um, I want I want to just reinvite everyone here tonight live with us. Um, any further questions? I I I also wanted to be mindful of linear space. If you feel a need to um, conclude before we do, please by all means do so. Don't feel obligated to stay with us, but want to allow a little bit more time to dialogue with Jabali. And we have a, another question or two um, from the the pre-session um, submissions. So yep. that said, um, thank you, Yvette. Um, Yvette says, so grateful for your medicine, Jabali. I am curious in your experience how you have seen restorative practices serve to shift the metrics upon which education learning is evolved. That's a great question. It is a great uh, question. Have, it is a really good Thank question. You. Okay. Take care, Lori. <laughs> um, you know, Yvette, there is, uh, again, because of where the focal point of measuring restorative work is, is usually in the discipline stuff. We don't see a whole lot around sort of school-wide metrics as it relates to uh, learning overall. It would be nice. Like your question is exactly what I want principals and others to pick up. That's the question. What happens if we do this and how, what's the difference that we'll see, right? I want that, I want them to pick that question up. What we do have is microcosms of it. So for instance, like my colleague, Emily, we can go back to all of her classes historically and her classes outperformed every other teacher teaching the same thing in the building. We know that there are teachers at Rainier Beach because they use this practice on a regular basis, their classrooms are just beautiful. And the kids are having an incredible experience and they're learning. So you know that they're doing good work in that classroom. Those same kids will then go next door to a class where it's not being done and it's all chaos. And the teacher codes the kids as problem children, right? We, you know that that can't be the case because they just came from next door where they were just doing some deep work and it was real good. So we have those microcosm anecdotes, but it's never anything. We, have, we haven't, the reason why, because we haven't had one principal who has fully embedded the practice in the school for them enough to start doing any kind of data collection to see outcome you know that's the hardest part that's the hardest part um i wish people would pick this question up <laughs> you know you know if they actually because again like i said a principal well he's already saying this doesn't work this way so then try another way and see what it, it does for you you know um i wish i had a better answer I really do. That's, that's it's good to see you too. It's been a Thank you. Yeah. It's good to see you too. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Yvette. That's such a an important question to ask. And what what's alive for me in that, if I may, quickly is it seems like we're afraid or unable to quantify the relational. Um, if we need to quantify then how do we shift our thinking away from the metrics of caseloads or of closures of cases or you know the all the metrics that we tie into funding as well I, there's so many pressures um but could we imagine a world of relational metrics yes you know because relationship is the currency 
for life itself. And everything that you've said tonight, if I'm hearing you correctly, is pointing that, pointing to that's that it. threat. That's it's it. It look just to see how serious that is, right? The Surgeon General has called it uh, it's the epidemic beyond all epidemics. It's the idea of being lonely, the idea of solitude, the idea of not being relationally collect connected calls it more damaging than cigarette smoking, right? Like that's that's the surgeon, that's not my words. That's the surgeon general. That's the surgeon general. And so then how wh what's it gonna take? for us to take that information and then start creating those systems that allows for us to literally meet that situation head on, as opposed to continuing to kick it down the can, the run down the road. Um, there's something about what's valuable. There's We've got such a twisted sense of what's valuable when it comes to employment, right? Um, to having gainful employment, what's valuable, right? This, the two two things I'd bring to this one. One is the um, a really smart man here in town says that you know the question of what skills do you bring to the place is the wrong question. The question is what presence do you bring to the place? Skills is just another way of saying your commodified abilities, you know, for capital gain. But your presence, that's something else. What's your presence that you bring to the space? Do you know what presence you bring to the space, right? I think a lot of people don't know how to answer that question, uh, which to me is scary. We see it manifesting, right? Um, but the other one is Mae Jemerson. Mae Jemerson, I got to see her speak one time, and it was another one of those moments where I'm like, I'm not crazy, you know? This is, <laughs> this is it. Because she was talking, and and she's explaining her 100 years in space program, beautiful ideas. I mean, and Sharp, that woman is smart. She's smart. You can't not, I, I, just done, done, smart, right? And she goes on to explain everything. And then she makes the point. She says, when you're up there in space, <clears throat> if you're coming along with me, I don't care who you are and I don't care what you know. If you don't know how to work with the people, around you you're a liability you're gone i was like that's it that's it that's right you're a liability our lives literally depend on you being able to work with us and if you can't do that you're you are literally a liability to us all so then what's really important it's not the knowledge or the skills. It's your ability to relate to the people around you. You can always get the skills. You can always get the knowledge. But we don't train enough on how to relate. We really don't. Um, yeah, my two cents. Again, these are just my thoughts. <laughs> you leave me speechless sometimes, often. Um... And Yvette, thank you again for coming in. And anyone who wishes to turn on their video, um, please feel free, free to. I just didn't um, want you to feel excluded in that format at this point. And um, Jabali, would you be willing to stick around for another maybe 10 minutes or so just to give space for a few more questions? I see another one no from Charito. And Yvette, are you complete, by the way? I just want to come back to you, Yvette. Did you feel complete? Okay. Thank you for chiming in and voicing in. I really appreciate you. And Charito, see you, I see your Charito, beautiful I love face. Your Would you like to voice in? Yes, yes, because you know sometimes we get lost into these systems and theories and ways and frameworks and whatever. And really, so much we have to just learn from connecting with nature because that is in itself restoration. So my question is not really something that is not essential. There is this beautiful white rural that I love from Peru. You know, this little kind of, I call it a little pearl <laughs> in the plant, this uh, hanging in the plants um, that is even mystical. Um, it brings good life according to, you know, a lot of wisdom from the people from Peru and other parts. 
And so what is the restoration? What is the connection? What did she tell you ab about restorative living that you put it in the equation and even in the name of who you are? I mean, how 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 you are why Rudo in our restoration? <laughs> That's a good question. Este, simplemente, mira, yo me casé con una peruana. I married a Peruvian woman, and she was part of the crew when we first started. And as we, so something we say often is go slow to go fast, right? We've been sitting in circles for a year, doing our work, doing our work, doing our work. And then we went away on a retreat, sat in circle deep, deep, deep. And she had brought Wairudos back from Peru. Yeah. Uh, explained them all, explained the significance. And after the gifting of the Wairudos, uh, we turned our conversation to what's going to be the name of our group? Because by then we were pretty cooked and we were ready to roll. That's a conversation. If you've ever done any of this kind of stuff, you know that that conversation can last for years. Like, what are we going to call her? So, what's the name? Blah, 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 blah. Go slow to go fast because we had sat in circle for so long. It it was a why do we are we are we call ourselves seeds, seeds of benediction, seeds of goodwill, seeds of good luck. It, we try to like literally spread that essence through the world through our work that's it's fundamental to who we are in the world mm -hmm. um and it, interestingly i you know how you got to know where you come from right because yes it, they're they're big in peru my father's from trinidad and um when i showed him a, a seed he says oh yeah we call those jumpy beans because they're in Trinidad too. And in Trinidad, the jumpy bean means exactly the same thing. It carries the same spiritual and all the other significance. It holds the exact same. done. We it, that was confirmation that that was exactly what our name was supposed to be. Great question. Yes, Thank you. Yes. And I I really see the beauty in the best way to make the connection for others to understand in the not only in the symbolism but the actual relationship and inspiration that a beautiful tiny piece of nature yeah is is it becomes so restorative that you want to be that thing you know That's right. and, uh, i i always believe that justice is intrinsically is intrinsic, it's nature, sacred nature is nature in Period. itself. That's right. Yeah. Thank that's, you. That's, that's the, what you're tapping into is when we say it's indigenous wisdom and practice, that's what you're tapping into, right? That's at the core of indigeneity. We are not devoid and separate from nature. We are nature, you know? How are we in relationship with nature? I see you, Vet. Thank you. You know, I got a question, right? Of course. Because <laughs> now we're getting rooted in nature. And this question has just been kind of rolling around in my consciousness for a little while. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious if you've had any brushes with this question in your experience. Um, I'm wondering if you have been present in a circle where um, where there are indigenous folks who have requested um, an addressing of the first harms. I mean, this practices indigenous practices um, and um, where there's been some space and some sharing and some, some something, something, something oh, anything, yes. something oh, around yeah. uh, the first harm that of, to the indigenous people of the land that we're sitting on even to have this happen kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh. yeah. Yes. Can you speak about that? That would be great to hear. I can give what I can, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, <laughs> it was glorious actually. 
got called in. Um, gosh, I gosh, I do need to be a little careful. Um, school related, all indigenous, and I even I entered into the work um, gingerly and tentatively open. The unfortunate, you know, reality was that it was there was tension internal. Um, and then as we do our work, you know how it works, right? You start seeing and peeling apart things and and then it came time for us to sit in circle proper. And as what, what <laughs> um as we do, right? The very ritual. I mean, I learned I learned circle very ritualized way. And then when we go and you sit inside institutions, they oftentimes ask you not to do that. And so I was having a hard time, actually. I said that to them. I said, um, because we're sitting where we are, I actually know I can't or shouldn't do the full ritual. They all pulled out all of their elements, and we went outside, and we took care of the business. And then we came back inside, and we sat in circle. And as it unfolded, it was real clear to your point. Uh, hurt from generations past is ever present. And they named it. Is there a conclusion to it? No. There's a being with it. And there's also a being with the reality of where we are right now. And so that actually had another circle. There was one indigenous man in that circle. I mean, after we finished with that, and he painted his picture of, you know, having, knowing people who are still waiting for their horse, it's kind of like black folks still waiting for their 40 acres and a mule. They, they're waiting, they're still waiting and knowing it's not coming. And when we finished that one up, I had to go outside and cry. It was, There's so much work that needs to be done there. It's not even funny. And I, uh, yeah. Yeah, and actually then to amend to all of this, you know, when we talk about the elders, I want to mention Tanaga Myers in there also, who is somebody who, uh, Mohawk Bear Clan, Seagull Clan, who I remember we did one of the trainings and um, she was running it. And it was this whole question about appropriation. Is it, I, I feel like I can't do this because of appropriation. And Tanaga works deeply with um, youth and reservations. And her big point was, you know, I've, we're working to keep these kids alive. And if you're worried about appropriation, that's you but we have work to do so either pick the work up and do it with fidelity or don't and understand who you are in in all of this and that was she basically told us all to get to work which i was like i'm i'm there i'm there yeah oh we lost you bet <laughs> That's a good question. I also want to let people know and remind people like indigenous isn't just to this territory, right? In Trinidad, there's a there's a funk, it's called Mbongi. It's a African-based circle technology, you know. And oftentimes we do these things and people, well, we didn't have that in Europe. I'm like, yeah, you did. We've had our colleague Keiko Ozeki, she knows of a Japanese variation that exists. It's indigeneity is global. Um, so let's not get hung up on that as we 
consider our work. However it is that you come to this, come to it open-hearted, fully intent on being in fidelity with what you have learned. I think Kay put out a call that is of the highest order when she says, that's why I asked the question, who will you not sit with? Um, Kay's call was to work towards being all partial. And that is not easy. There is always somebody you don't want to sit with. So uh, in my hunt, in my work, my own path of becoming all partial, I need to be really clear about who it is I don't want to sit with so that I can actually start doing that work so that I can become <laughs> all partial. It's a work of a lifetime. I will probably never achieve it, but it, it's if that's not good work, I don't know what is. Say that. Diwali, thank you so much for the richness that you shared of your experience, your journey, uh, the things that you've witnessed. Uh, it's just been extraordinary to be with you. And thank you so much to the community um, who have voiced in this evening and those who have been present. Equally important. Amen. Equally important. Um, just wanting to give a few more moments for anyone to chime in with a voice uh, of a question and a comment. And also uh, just a quick reminder that yes, this will be definitely on the YouTube channel. And it's important to just put out there that um, for, for the video recording, if anyone has any needs around that, please let me or us know just so that we can try and take care of you as best we can with the technology editing, if that's a need. Um, the, 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 the importance of these spaces is to go deeply and also you know, to go widely as well for those who couldn't be here with us tonight. So if you were here tonight and you have a need around the recording, just reach out. Um, that's of course a value that I think we as practitioners carry forth very, um, very seriously, actually, of confidentiality, of taking care of each other in that way. So um, with that said, thank you, Charito. Thank you, Yvette, Nancy, Sally, Beverly, um, and all of the wonderful people that were here that had to leave tonight. And those of you listening in on the podcast, um, Jabali, would you like to close us out with some concluding thoughts and then I'll have a, a quick wrap up and reminder for people of what's coming up in the, the weeks to come. Sure. Yeah. Uh, concluding thoughts. Check out. Um, Molly, thank you so much for opening the door and the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, it was really delightful to see some old familiar faces and to meet new ones. Charity, was really good to meet you. Uh, thank you for the deep questions. Thank you for just even engaging in any of this. Um, as my colleague says, we need each other. And that's it. So if you're ever in Seattle and you want to sit in circle, the last Monday, actually, we do them online. You don't even have to be. The last Monday of every month, we have a community circle open to all. I didn't know that. So... Could you please let us know how we can can participate? What's What do we do if we want to come to the community circle? We go to our website and under offerings, you'll okay. see a monthly, monthly circle in English. Beautiful. Um, Thank you. Limited thoughts. So by all means, please, please come. And if you ever want me around, just let me know. <laughs> and Sonali, could you also share with us, um, for those who are tuning in that might like to inquire about um, possible services with you all, how do they go about doing yeah. that? So you can either write me directly. I think my email might be right here somewhere. Or if you go to our website, there is a request, um, what do you call it? service request form that you okay. can use and it reaches all of us so you'll be in good hands 
And and could you state the website again, just so people know yeah. what you're referring to? I put it in the chat, but for those listening, please. Yeah. Website is www.wearewairudo.com. And Wairudo is spelled H-U-A-Y-R-U-R-O. So it's W-E-A-R-E-H-U-A-Y-R-U-R-O.com. Mm. We are Wairudo.com. Thanks, Molly. Thank you so very much. And um, just wanting to acknowledge and honor again, all of the teachers that have added their wisdom and, and attention for days, years, lifetimes, um, those known, yes. those unknown, equally important and globally. Yes. So, um, and Jabali, right. thank you for being my friend and mentor in this field. I've learned so much from you as well. And I'm, I'm truly looking forward to further conversations here. We need to have you back for another one. So the door's always open, <laughs> always willing. <laughs> so at, this, at this juncture, I just want to come back um, to make a reminder for people, hopefully not too abruptly here, of what's coming up. And um, we're very privileged and honored to host some incredible people as of course tonight with Jabali. And our next scheduled podcast is March 7th. Um, that's a live dialogue with Deborah Rosman of the Institute of Heart Math. She'll be talking about heart coherence, heart brain coherence, and how that supports regulation um, for practitioners. And um, can't wait to hear from her. And then Danielle Sered, um, it's the five-year anniversary of Until We Reckon, and she'll be with us on April 4th. And then also coming up will be Dominic Barter, one of my teachers as well, um, possibly yours as well, um, and can't wait to have him back on the podcast. There's an extraordinary array on iTunes and Spotify for you to tune into. Please spread the word about this important media platform. It's coming from the ground level up. Um, we also talk about theory for sure, but we're a grassroots um, people's platform for this discussion, for advocacy, connection, and reconnection, so that you know that you're not alone in the world in serving restoratively and being restorative, um, whatever that means to you. And um, mm. so grateful for your for you participating tonight. And for those of you listening in, be well and can't wait to be with you again soon. So Jabali Stewart, thank you and good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>